What is up ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Time for a brand new build experience in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. With the release of Anniversary Edition, plenty of new content has been added, introducing artifacts from the lore that featured in previous entries, as well as more quests, home and armor options in general. With all of this in mind, we have tailored these new builds to utilize the best of this content, and today I present to you the Death Weaver. Her arrows whistle through the black, finding their target by finger-plucked instruction. Her master, the web spinner, is served another soul. The Death Weaver is not to be seen. She is the cold hands you don't see coming. And if she is glimpsed, she stings with unparalleled speed, only to vanish once more and strike again from the shadows while you sleep. You are never safe if she is your hunter. Before we dive into the build, I want to tell you that we've been fortunate enough to have ExpressVPN sponsor this video. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network service that masks your activity online and it helps protect your information. It's incredibly easy to set up and use. Simply fire up the app and connect with just one click. One of my favorite things about it is how easy it makes it to change your locations when streaming movies and shows. Netflix always seems to be changing what's available in each country, but with ExpressVPN, I can just change my location from Australia to the US, Canada, or wherever else I need to so that I can watch the things I want that aren't available in my country. Recently, I used ExpressVPN to set my location so I could re-watch Breaking Bad and Avatar The Last Airbender. And if you're in the US, you can also switch your location to view things that you're unable to access, from historical action shows like the Viking series to sitcoms like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And of course, you can do this to get the most from other streaming services too. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash fudgemuppet or clicking the link in the description below. But now it's time for the backstory of the Death Weaver. My name is Savura Halalu. My great-grandfather was a councilman of the Dunmer House Halalu before it faced its betrayal in the wake of the Fourth Era. Without the Empire, the other great houses fell upon them and delivered their spiteful vengeance. None of them had realized, like Halalu did, that in the great wind of progress, tradition cannot stand. Whatever hegemony the other great houses still had was quickly turned to cinders after Red Mountain broke and spilled destruction onto their homes. Mere months later, lizards of the south came like vultures, picking over the corpse of a dying Morrowind. Thankfully, my ancestors escaped such a cruel fate. My grandfather had friendship with Count Andalindaris of Chadenhall, and so immigration was secured for my family. Many of House Lalu did the same, but enough about ancient history. This was all many years before my birth. My eyes first opened year 175 of the Fourth Era, born into a war-torn province in an ever-growing slum of Chadenhall, filled with others who looked like me. My parents died when I was young. My aunt would never tell me the details. I figure it was skooma or rubbery. I lived with her and my uncle and my cousins, in a cramped wooden house pressed against many others. A tattered banner of House Lalu hung above the alcove where the waiting door sat, a shrine with idols to the reclamations. I spent little time here as a child, and why would you? It was a musty closet of a home, and outside was far more exciting. Thieves, brawls, skooma gangs, addicts, charlatans, and an energy one could not mistake for anywhere else in the world. Think the Grey Quarter of Windhelm times ten, but without the prejudice Nords. Don't get me wrong, there was prejudice aplenty, but Imperials are far more subtle with it for the most part. And anyways, the slums in which I lived spread far outside the city walls, and to see someone without grey skin was rare. I fell in with some unsavoury crowds. My cousin Niluva did too. Apparently, the Dominion has a strong stance against the proclivities of the Khajiit, and many, shall I say, entrepreneurs of elsewhere, have found themselves spread across Cyrodiil, sharing their feel-good sugar, and more often than not, distilling it into the sweetness that is skooma. It was a problem there, but in it, I found opportunity. I was smart enough to not touch the stuff, but I had no problem running it. Kept me fed with better food than salt rice slop. The wrong crowds found me soon, and by 13 I was in the pocket of the Kamana Tong, a Dunmary nationalist crime organization that had capitalized on the city's growing tumor that many took to calling New Narciss. My cousin Naluva hung in similar crowds leeching off of the bosses, trading flesh for another hit. All I wanted was to rise to the top, live like a queen among a nest of rats. That was, at any rate, until I met Phyrona. Phyrona was amazing. She had joined as a hitman for the Tong, taking out the competition for a hefty fee, though she was well worth the price from what I had seen and heard. I would try to stay close to her, eat at the same tables, bathe at the same creek. She had a tattoo of a spider spanning her entire back, 
done in a style similar to that of the temple's frescoes, a beautiful piece. One day, when I was 16, we were put on the same job, her as the muscle along with two others. I was the watchdog. I watched her crack a man's front row of teeth with a single strike of her hand. No one seemed to talk to her outside of business. She didn't exactly have a friendly disposition. But one day I walked up to her and said, teach me how to do what you do. The room was silent except for Phyrona's chewing. She swallowed, leant backward, and looked right at me with ruby eyes glinting in the light of the lanterns. No, she said simply and walked outside. The room erupted in laughter, but I followed her through the mud-slicked streets until my aunt found me. What are you doing, you fool? I heard you went to Bell Rooms with some friends and smashed up his shop. This is not how I raised you. A screaming match ensued, I caught blame for Naluva's skooma addiction and everything else wrong with our circumstances. I didn't put Naluva on the stuff. I even adamantly objected to her trying it, but regardless, I was a scapegoat. So I did what I always did then. I ran away from it. I went to my usual spot, a place called Lake Popad. It took some time to get there but I was planning to just stay out there and sleep under the stars, dreaming of other lives. Come dawn, I woke and washed in the lake, and suddenly out of nowhere. Do you like being followed? I jumped and snapped my vision all around until I saw. It was Phyrona, smirking, sitting on a rock with a bow aimed to fire at me. I went to move, and the air whistled as an arrow splashed into the water before me. Uh-uh, don't go running, or next time I won't miss. I was terrified. I started blurting about how I wasn't following her, and then I gave that up, and I said it was because I thought she was amazing, and I was curious about her tattoo, and then I delved into pleading so that she wouldn't kill me. By the end of it all, she put down the bow and started belly laughing, <laughs> leaning back on the rock she sat on, all while I stood there naked, knee-deep in water and quivering, thinking my life was about to end. I actually pissed myself. Phyrona had known I followed her, knew I was obsessed with her, and that is where my story as the Death Weaver began. She trained me and taught me everything I knew. I stayed with her, was protected by her, and eventually we left New Narcissus together. She told me who she was, a Death Weaver, a member of the ancient spider cult, devotees of Mephala, the last of her kind, she told me. I watched her devotion daily as she lied, as she seduced, as she killed. She spoke of Mephala in a different light. She built upon the philosophies of the temple and gave me an understanding of the web spinner that encompassed all. Phyrona had given me everything. Agency, power, skill, knowledge, philosophy, and love. I don't know why she chose me. Maybe she saw something in me, or maybe I was just the first person in a long time to take an interest in her outside of a professional capacity. But I suspect at the root of it all, there was a duty. A duty to continue the spider cult. She didn't tell me much of it, only that she was the last, and that she lived on borrowed time. She had an illness, didn't tell me the specifics, no matter how much I begged, but she was going to die, and then she did. Our last moments were two years ago in Bruma. With no Dark Brotherhood operating in Cyrodiil anymore, there was plenty of work for us. She died, knowing that I would carry on the way of the Death Weavers, and one day, a new widow would be found. I mourned in Bruma and remained grateful for Phyrona, the hand that plucked me from squalor and gave me purpose and the means to achieve it. But now it is time to move on, cherish the gifts she bestowed upon me, and start this new chapter of my life over the border in Skyrim. All right, so that is the backstory, and from it, you should have a pretty firm idea of who this character is. But in this role-playing section, there is plenty to talk about for the Death Weaver. Firstly, I want to note something about her appearance. When she isn't wearing a hood, you can see her long, thin, silver hair. And this is known to happen to Mafala's champions. I thought it was a nice touch for the character, but if you're opposed to the look, I sort of left it out of the backstory for those reasons. But just so you know, that is why I chose the silver whitish colored hair, like a Dunma Witcher. Now, from the backstory, you would know that her cousin, Naluva Halalu, is a skooma addict, and she also happens to be an NPC in Riften. Now, you're going to have to do a little bit of a in-your-head role-playing, but you can actually find Naluva in Riften. Perhaps the two can have a little reunion, or perhaps Naluva, deep in her addiction, won't recognize Savura, especially since it's been a long time since they last saw each other, and Savura now has silver hair, and, well, 
she's been trained as an assassin and it's been many years. But Naluva is somewhat of a symbolic representation of what Savura could have become had her path kept her in Chadenhall. But little details aside, let's talk about factions and quests and what there is to do with the Death Weaver in this frigid land of Skyrim. Well, since we were talking about Riften, let's talk about the Thieves' Guild. Joining Brynjolf and his entourage is going to be of a great benefit to Savura. She is a Halalu in blood, and Enterprise runs in her veins. Climbing the ranks using very similar skill sets and building out her own organization is going to be a powerful asset and a great source of wealth. Becoming Guildmaster is the name of the game, and of course you have to become a Nightingale for the story, but remember, as a devotee of Mephala, the Daedric Prince of Lies, Sex, and Secret Murder, Deception comes naturally, and if you can get away with it, why not deceive the Daedra? Also, the player home, Shadowfoot Sanctum, which can be purchased from Vekel, is a brilliant home for this character, a private and reclusive base for this spider cult assassin. But of course, an assassin feels most at home when ending lives, and while the whole thieves component takes advantage of her stealth prowess, we want to find an organization that fits her skill set, and there is only one such outfit in the land of Skyrim, the Dark Brotherhood. Now, remember, the Death Weaver is not some kind of Morag Tong assassin. Never has been. She was a member of the Spider Cult, which is unaffiliated with any sort of legal entity in Morrowind, and they are entirely devoted to Mafala. So Salvira has no objection to the Dark Brotherhood, and within this family, she will thrive. For a fun role-playing angle, I think it's actually fun to lean into the Night Mother is Mephala angle, and Salvira as the listener will believe that she is speaking to one of Mephala's deceptions. Symbolically, as listener, she will become the Widow of the Spider Cult. The figure that in the past communed with Mephala directly and relayed her words to the cult. Savura here is doing the exact same thing, but a different cult, different titles, but the same entity is at the core, the web spinner herself. Hell, you can even role playing that you are slowly converting the Dark Brotherhood into the Spider Cult. After becoming both the listener of a rebuilt Dark Brotherhood and Guildmaster of the Thieves Guild, she will be the head of the most widespread and influential shadowy organizations in Skyrim. Deception is a big part of this character. She uses the tools of lies, sex, and murder to execute her master plans, and this role-playing note can help bring clarity to some otherwise rather stiff situations. For example, interacting with Daedric Princes becomes a lot more interesting when you use the same dialogue in service to them, but interpret that dialogue as a lie. So when you say to Hermaeus Mora that you will serve as his gracious champion, deep down you know that you serve only Mephala, but you will do what it takes and say what needs to be said to achieve what you want. Lies and murder. Nothing is off limits. Same goes for other Daedric Princes, with a few exceptions. The Reclamations, Mephala, Azura, and Boethia will be at minimum respected, and in the case of Mephala, of course, revered. Azura's star will be claimed and her will followed, and you shall sacrifice a friend upon the altar of Boethia and claim the Ebony Mail. For Mephala, you will claim the Ebony Blade and use it ceremonially to charge it with the blood of the deceived. None of these artifacts are of daily use to the Death Weaver, however, they are revered and cherished, kept well in her Shadowfoot Sanctum. In the same vein of respecting the Reclamations, the Death Weaver is going to be particularly aware of the four corners of the House of Troubles, and they are Mehrunes Dagon, Malakath, Shergorath, and Molag Bao. Now, Arguably, Merun's Dagon, Malakath, and Shergorath's quests start relatively indirectly, as in you're helping certain individuals, and arguably this could be done if you want. However, I feel as if Molag Bell's quest is quite directly serving a god, and he isn't the best fit for this character. And then again, you can always use the deception angle. You're simply lying, a double agent of the Daedra. But regardless, none of those artifacts are of particular use to the Death Weaver anyway, and they don't really fit her skill set. Another quest. The Cause, from Anniversary Edition, actually takes you on a journey to defeat the resurgence of the Mythic Dawn cult, and I would say this fits quite well. And with Mephala, you have an interest in preventing other princes from asserting their domain over Tamriel. So it makes sense. Also, for any Dunma character, going to Solstheim is a must. There's just so much culture there to explore and plenty of quests to do. However, Anniversary Edition has also added the existence of an Omsavi cult on the island, which you can hunt down and kill in the name of Mephala. Plus, doing so grants you many Morrowind-themed items and pieces to then become a part of your audacious collection in Shadowfoot Sanctum. Also, while on Solstheim, you can help out the Reclaim tribe, which will help you craft Netch Leather for the character's 
aesthetic. I do have to say for this character, we are definitely not leaning into the Dragonborn role. It is suitable to completely ignore all of it. However, that could possibly deprive you of the Dragonborn storyline, which I think is a good fit, exploring Hermaeus Mora and so on, collecting the Black Books, and Hermaeus Mora is described as the sibling of Mephala anyway, so it's quite interesting. So if you do follow through with the main quest, just downplay it or don't make it a large component of your character. Now, there is also the Dawnguard quest line, and I think the best fit is to join the Dawnguard and purge Molag Val's corruption, fighting the putrid vampires he has spawned upon this world. Plus, playing around with some of the new crossbows could be real fun for a character who already has great marksman skills. As for the other factions, the Companions and the College of Winterhold are just not good fits at all and should be avoided. The Civil War could be done if you wanted to, but I would definitely go with the Imperials over the pro Nord Stormcloaks. But I think that just about covers everything in regards to role playing the Death Weaver. And if not, I'm sure between the backstory and the rest of the sections on skills and gear and such, you should have a very complete picture. With that said, let's get into more of the statistical components of this build. So clearly the Death Weaver is a Dunma. She may have pointy ears like other elves, but there is no mistaking the signature grey skin and red eyes. This decision is entirely due to a role playing focus. 50% fire resistance is nice, but it's by no means a motivating factor behind the decision. The backstory and role playing sections will have made this apparent, but the Dark Elf choice is because of the background and history of the character. So now let's look at the stats. When playing this build, I had a lot of fun calling it a challenge build. Not that it's insanely challenging or anything, but I did want to build a character around a single stat investment that is rather unconventional. So if you want to be really extreme, unnecessarily so, then you could go all in on stamina. Giving you the ultimate glass cannon, you will have unlimited sneak rolls, sprinting, carry weight, and heaps of bow zoom time to slow down the world as you place your shot with your amazing reflexes. Despite your light armor, you are still going to be pretty damn fragile, and with a build meant to be in the shadows, and with the OP and visibility effect of the bow of shadows, it should offset this to a degree. However, it can get a little bit silly at times with such low health, so for the less crazy, I would suggest investing into health until 200 and then do the rest into stamina. But look, at the end of the day, if you want to change it up, you will. But I really did want a crazy amount of stamina for this build, purely for the fun component. You can always sprint away. You'll always be able to use slow time zoom for your bow. And it's just awesome. So you know the race and stats. What about the standing stone? Will it be another classic Fudge Muppet style Atronarch stone recommendation? Or will it actually be the other stone they pick when they want to change it up? The one called the Lord Stone. Well, actually, in this specific circumstance, we are going to pick neither. The defensive capabilities of both of these stones are going to be largely irrelevant for a character that is going to enter danger unseen and deadly. This character isn't built to tank hits. However, at the same time, we aren't silly, so we do improve our armor rating via smithing and enchant it, giving us a solid magic resistance. And of course, the Lord Stone would help both of these by maximizing them further. And to be honest, it would be the best choice. So I cannot blame you at all for choosing that. However, for fun and utility, I was thinking to pick the Tower Stone. As we don't get any of the lockpicking perks, and as a thief and assassin, you may find yourself in a situation where you want to quickly open a door and be done with it, instead of fiddling with a lock for five minutes. And so with the Tower Stone, once a day, you can unlock any lock with an expert difficulty or lower. It's a stone I feel that doesn't get used much, and I felt like it was a good fit. Again, the Lord Stone is probably more of your power gaming type of play. Also, people may be thinking of the Shadow Stone, but with the Bow of Shadows enchantment, the Shadow Stone is almost entirely redundant. Okay, time to get into the skills. They are archery, light armor, sneak, speech, smithing, and enchanting. The Death Weaver embodies the ideals of an assassin and combines it with the shrewd nature of a Hlalu. She has a silver tongue, whether it was selling skooma, seducing a target, or tailoring a network of connections and friendships to support her organization, the Death Weaver can deliver the diplomatic and profitable solution. However, sometimes diplomacy's failure is inevitable, and that is when she ducks into the shadows with her sneak skill and strategically plucks souls from mortals with the pull of a string, aka get a bullseye between the eyes with her bow of shadows. And as for smithing, enchanting, and light armor, well, these are the true synthesis of her Lalu heritage and assassin skill 
tool set. Her craftsman skills are put to work with the best materials, acquired with the best prices, and made to her exact custom specifications. When doing work as dangerous as Savura's, you can't have poor craftsmanship of gear be your downfall. However, the core of the gameplay is going to be rather straightforward. All of these skills are going to naturally grow as you use them. It's not like you have to specifically train any of them. Just be sure to keep upgrading your gear and disenchant enchanted items for XP, but let's talk about some of the perks you may need. The rest will be shown on screen. I'm only going to talk about the highlights relevant to this build. First, Archery, Eagle Eye and Steady Hand 2 out of 2 are going to be vital for this build and they are a big reason for the high stamina because with it you'll be able to hold these long time perfect zoom headshots and kills and we really want the slow time matrix kind of vibe for this character. Quick Shot is going to let us draw our bow 30% faster on top of the 20% bonus already given from the Bow of Shadows, which ultimately lets us fire like Legless. And on top of that, we want a Ranger, which will allow total freedom of movement while stringing an arrow. Light Armor is next, and as you can imagine, the perks are pretty straightforward. However, Windwalker is a particularly useful one, which makes it so when you're wearing all Light Armor, you get 50% more stamina regen. And when you're talking about a stamina pool of something like 500 or more, then you're going to be restoring a lot of stamina real quick. It's a great fit for this build. Sneak is a situation where we take the lot minus Assassin's Blade because we aren't using daggers. All of these perks help us do more damage from the shadows and helps us stay in them. Shadow Warrior works really well in combination with the Bow of Shadows invisibility enchantment, so you have a whole host of tricks to use. Speech is all about the money making here. Super useful for gathering materials to enchant and smith your armor and jewelry, but also lucrative for money making yourself. And things like Master Trader and Fence just make the whole money making process that much easier. Smithing, we need steel, elven and advanced armors so we can be making shadowed leather armor and upgrading it as we see fit and also arcane blacksmith to improve things like the guildmaster's hood and bow of shadows as well as upgrading your currently enchanted gear. As for enchanting, it's just insanely useful as you all know and if you shoot up the middle of the branch you get the best of all the perks that in combination will allow you to get a whole host of useful enchantments for your armor perfecting your assassin's equipment. Speaking of all Savura's gear, let's get into it. In terms of early on in the game, faction armors such as the Thieves or Dark Brotherhood sets are quite handy and come with solid enchantments for the early game. But for the look, we really want to get Netch armor and ultimately the Shadowed Netch armor for the aesthetic. The Bow of Shadows, on the other hand, is achievable quite early on. Speak to Preventus in Dragon's Reach and Whiterun and you can start a quest to prevent an assassination plot. By the end, you can get your hands on the Bow of Shadows and man... Is it a powerful bow? In terms of damage, it is on par with a Daedric bow. However, it comes with an insane enchantment which increases weapon draw speed by 20% and every time you ready it, it casts invisibility for 30 seconds. You can see just how insane this draw speed can get, especially when you get the 30% boost from the quickshot perk later on. And the invisibility is perfect for this stealth character. And it is simple as putting away the bow and redrawing it in order to reinstate the invisibility effect after firing. So early game, you can get the signature bow of this build and you can work on the armor as you progress but I would recommend going to Solstheim and doing the Reekling tribe associated with the natural leather armor as soon as you can handle it. But let's talk about the aim for this character, the armor set we really want. Now the headpiece is mostly for a cool aesthetic. The hood is the guildmaster's hood and the black color suits the shadowed leather and it also does improve the prices you get at stores but if you really want a power game you could probably use the boiled shadowed natural leather helmet and enchant it with what you like. But Aesthetics are important for us, and the enchantment fits the Hlalu heritage of the character anyways. We are going to want to get the Boiled Shadowed Leather Armor, and for its enchantments, I chose Poison Resistance and Stamina Regeneration. I thought Poison Resistance fits being a champion of Mephala, Next, let's look at the Shadowed Natural Leather Boots, which boost our sneaking and, once again, our stamina regeneration. The Shadowed Natural Leather Gauntlets are going to boost our sneaking again, but also our bow damage. Of course, you may use any ring or necklace of your choosing, but for both of them, I would recommend boosting your bow damage and your magic resistance, which at max levels, with perks and potions and such, you should get something like 25% magic resistance on both, bringing your total to 50%, but you can also boost that further by getting the Lordstone, which would bring 
raising it to 75%, which is just short of the cap anyways. Those were the primary enchantments I would consider for all of the armor pieces, and you can consistently apply them to your new sets of armor until you have reached the ideal situation. Before twin enchantments, I would definitely prioritize bow damage and then things like sneaking. Ultimately, one of my favorite things about this build is that it doesn't take long to achieve the playstyle of this build. Sometimes builds don't become fully realized till certain artifacts or late game abilities have been acquired. However, the Death Weaver simply needs to get the Bow of Shadows ASAP and then the rest falls into place as you play and up your skills. But let's talk about the playstyle. I may as well say we aren't really using any spells or powers, or at least I'm not going to prescribe any for this character because I don't feel like they fit. And let's be real, the Bow of Shadows is a power in itself. When approaching any combat scenario, stealth is 100% the priority. Remember this character is fragile but deadly. This is a stealth archer and the consequences for failing can often be death. However, by the late game, you have a lot of enchantments and stronger armor to help counter this, but even still, it's all emergency fallback. Usually, the plan, if seen, is to to run, reapply Bow of Shadows invisibility, and approach from the shadows once more. However, as your skills improve, as I show in the video, you can do some more of the charge in Legolas styles trick shot play when you have the Ranger perk for movement speed. Ultimately, all the stamina and stamina regen you have will give you a lot of options for movement, sprinting or slowing time from aiming, you're just basically too fast. There isn't much to explain, the gameplay footage shown should have given you a good idea, but this is what I would say is the ultimate stealth archer, or maybe even just archer experience in general. But that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is everything you need to know how to play the Death Weaver build. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed playing this new vanilla Skyrim build, utilizing the new content that comes with the Anniversary Edition. Subscribe for more Elder Scrolls content builds, lore, and our weekly Elder Scrolls podcast. If you love the channel, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. It makes a big difference. Thanks so much for all of your support, and do be sure to like the video if you enjoyed it, because it really helps out the channel. Thanks again. My name's Scott from Fudge Muppet. I'll be back to know out with you again next time.